We now have our final speaker for this morning's session. I'm pleased to invite Carrie Denniston, who is Senior Director for Sustainability at Walmart, uh, to the podium. Carrie has extensive experience dealing with managing supply chains, both globally uh, as well as across the U.S. Uh, where Walmart operates stores. She brings her perspective on creating environmentally and socially sustainable supply chains from agriculture and production through distribution. Carrie, welcome. Thanks for being here. Good morning, everyone. It's really great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this presentation as well. Nicole, I, I laughed when you came up to the stand and said, I, I have this confession to make because that was exactly what I was thinking. Um, it's really hard to say, all right, uh, go ahead and talk for 20 minutes about sustainable food systems. Go. That's an incredible and daunting task, um, especially when you think about the complexity of these issues and as thinking about the role that retailers and specifically Walmart plays in that. I could have taken that from any angle. Should we talk about food waste? Should we talk about global policy? Should we talk about local systems? There's any number of doors that we could have walked through there. And as I listened over the last couple of days um, to all of the unbelievable data and thought and presentations that, that everyone has given, I just kept reflecting on how layered all of this data and information is and the kinds of conclusions that that means that we can draw. Um, and I really came to one central idea, and that is that regardless of which door any of us walk through, food waste, uh, maybe that's local systems, whatever that is for you, um, this all really, really quickly becomes muddled. And you will very quickly run in to someone else walking through a different door and create consequences. When we maximize for one thing, we create issues somewhere else. Nicole just talk of, talked about the relationship between we can maximize for fruit and vegetable, but what about water stress? Even outside of sort of the specific idea around food systems itself, maybe we want to maximize around food waste, and so we start thinking about packaging food differently because that's going to extend the life. What does that do as we think about plastic waste that gets created in those systems? So we can maximize for really good things, but pretty quickly we are going to create consequences that are good or bad or a mixture for another door that someone else is walking through. And so today I want to talk a little bit about that and where retail sits in this sort of nexus in the center between all of these different issues um, and how we are thinking about the implementation of a lot of the ideas that have been shared. So for anyone that doesn't know, Walmart, we're a humble retailer out of Bentonville, Arkansas. We have a few stores, about 11,000 of them around the globe, um, plus multiple e-commerce platforms as well. Um, and with that, well, we serve about 27 countries around the world, and about 270 million customers every year. We source from about 100 different countries around the globe. So that's an unbelievable complex system. Um, and in many ways, we end up being this interface between supply chain and demand, because we see the customer as they walk through the door, and we play this signaling role, sending back and forth between where supply chains are at and where customers are going. So just a few notes on, on context, and I don't think any of these will be surprising to any of you. These are not specifically around the food system, but a bit about the global state of the world. So in our, our mission to save money so people can live better, um, that doesn't exist at a static state. It's not going to be static over the next 10, 15, 20 years by any means. Um, and this slide shows just a little bit around um, some, some interesting and confusing trends. So what we see here is that global prosperity and some of the markers of global prosperity is actually moving in some positive directions if you look at some pieces of the data. But you also see that inequality is, is increasing. So there's a number of conclusions that we can draw from this kind of information, but one that I think that is of particular importance is the fact that while consumption demand is going to continue to increase, so is the pressure around price and affordability. As more people are going to want more things, um, we also have to think about their ability to access those things overall. Price will continue to matter. 
We also look at the fact that from a social and environmental point of view, we already have that demand creating resource pressure. That resource pressure will continue to rise, and that's going to have social and environmental consequences. I don't think that we can separate those, and we can talk a little bit more about how that starts to show up. So taking that longer term view, um, that really actually provides us with a number of opportunities. And I want to talk a little bit about how Walmart then enters into that conversation to think about our role. So we think about the idea of creating shared value. And what we mean by that is that we think that doing good in the world is actually also good for business. Now, I would actually argue and go so far as to say is that you actually can't do one without the other if you want to be in business in the long term. Because things like surety of supply, things like actually helping to support on resources and supporting smallholder farmers, developing out sustainable food systems. If we are not doing that, then none of the rest of this will matter. Now, this photo is, was taken at um, a store in our mass mart business in South Africa. And I love this photo because it really brings this idea to life. The area where this photo was taken did not have a lot of formal retail before we were there. And what MassMart was able to bring was access to food, affordability, and food safety from improvements in things like cold chain and logistics support. It's a great example of the kind of aspiration that we have for the food system, that we can bring safe, healthy, affordable food to people in the times and the places where they need it. So that is, we're looking for a system that achieves adequate, sustainable supply, is regenerative to the environment, is good for the people who produce the food, and is good for the people who eat the food. Now, I suspect that many of you are hearing that and saying, well, yes, I want that too. Um, and how do we make that, and what roles can we play in doing that? And the answer is that actually no one business, no one sector, no one academic, no one NGO is going to be able to do that alone. And I know, and I'll speak a little bit to Walmart's large, and why can't we just get that done? And I'll talk to you a little bit about why that's complex. But we are going to need changes in infrastructure. We're going to need changes in behavior to be able to drive that kind of systemic change and change the kind of incentives we need to shift behavior. So this is a little bit about how we think about shared value. So we look to where we can do the most good. As I said, as we think about sourcing in 100 countries around the world and different types of supply chain, we don't have the resources and ability to be able to focus on everything, everywhere, and all issues. So how do we prioritize? So we look at where can we make the most change and where is the most risk and potential for things to go wrong. And we think about the tools that we have at our disposal. We have purchase order for food. We have suppliers. We have logistics expertise. We have the ability to know how supply chains are changing over time. And then we prioritize those efforts. We also have the tool of philanthropy, which we use to help think about where do we need to catalyze an innovation, fill a gap, or scale a promising program that doesn't yet have market viability or government support to scale on its own. We also have 270 million customers who tell us what they want by what they buy. So here's a little bit about how we think about the work and what our role is for how we try to move it forward, and a few examples of some of the things that we're doing. And I'll share a few more details around some of these. There are really two major streams of work here. So we think about supply chain on one side, and we think about the consumer demand on the other side. So seafood is a really interesting example of how this all gets muddled together and why these issues of social and environmental implications are so inextricably linked. So think, for example, about shrimp. So shrimp may be grown in aquaculture ponds, and they need to be fed protein. So that protein often comes from what's known in the industry in a delightful term known as trash fish. So trash fish is, mar is food that is um, fished out of the sea. So fish comes out, gets onto the boat, but it doesn't have market value. So it might be a species that people don't like to buy. And that's the kind of protein that ends up going into fish meal to feed the shrimp. Now, way back in that supply chain on those boats that are catching that fish meal, that's actually where the greatest risk is for workers on those boats to experience exploitation. 
So passports being withheld, being forced to work long hours. Um, there's not a lot of visibility into the formal supply chain. It's so far back in the system. That's a key issue as we think about sustainable food systems, what's happening to those folks on those boats. But now shift the lens, shift the perspective to the boat captain who is actually captaining that boat. That captain is having to go out and fish longer, more days, for a much more extended and wider trip period of time just to get the same catch. And he's really worried about being able to meet the economic need that he has had. On another boat, further up the supply chain, fishing for some other things, there's a crew that's actually trying to fish and meet all the standards of sustainable certification. They really want to be able to do it the right way. And they pull up that catch, and they take it to port, and it goes off. And when it gets to the wholesaler who's then aggregated it, well, he doesn't have enough demand to actually keep it separated. It's not worth it economically. And so it all gets muddled together, and it never makes it to the market with a signal that said, we worked hard to catch this sustainably. In a nearby village, there's a farmer, and she is really working hard at her aquaculture ponds. And she has been, she's perfected what she's doing and thinking really hard about that. But her neighbor has not been judicious about water quality. And the runoff from that pond is now bringing disease into her ponds. And the harvest is not going to come through this year. Somewhere around the world, there's a family that walks into a store and sees all this great information about healthy food and what seafood can provide for them. But they're worried about being able to afford it. And that starts to bring us to the other side. That starts to think about how do we deliver healthy food messages and talk about um, what, is, what is good and how people can navigate it and find it. But it's also about food access. We're also talking about hunger as well as nutrition and food insecurity issues for families that are thinking about resources. So at Walmart and the Walmart Foundation, for example, we made a commitment to help provide four billion meals over five years to people in need because of that kind of issue. We also support things like strengthening the charitable food system and access to programs like SNAP. That's one example. It's one supply chain. We just took a trip around the world, and all of those individuals, all of those communities are acting completely rationally for why they are doing what they are doing. So we have tremendous opportunity and challenges as we think about all of the other supply chains in which we are all trying to work. So it would be incredibly easy to get lost in how complex this all is. Does anyone else feel that way? Because yeah. <laughs> I know I do. I know I do. Um, but the, the reality and the promise and the positive side of this story is the same phenomenon that I talked about in the beginning. And we can walk through any one of these doors, and we can start to run into one of these other issues. The converse of that is true. We can walk through any one of these doors and test ideas, test tools, test innovations, and create positive changes into that system that account for some of these externalities and implications. Um, so I want to share a little bit with you about some of our lessons learned. Um, and I'll use some of the examples of some of these projects that we've been working on that are tools or innovations that we think I can give an example from one supply chain, but I think has the potential to scale to multiple supply chains. So these will sound extremely simple. <laughs> and I think that's a good thing, because it's good for us to be able to focus on those kinds of things. Um, and I'm going to start with the first one, which is defining what good looks like is an incredibly powerful tool. It is so helpful to be able to know how do we point people into what they should be doing. Dietary guidelines is an example of that. Thinking about two degrees Celsius reduction, these markers and points in time to saying this is what is valuable if we all point in the same direction has incredible value. So one example of this is that the Walmart Foundation has been investing in small and medium enterprises in China and helping them to understand how to mitigate food safety risks and practices around food safety. Now, the first step of being able to do that was to be able to say, here's what it means to have food safety practices and have a shared understanding and code that the, the industry in China could agree upon. Because we couldn't start training, we couldn't start delivering until that code was in place. 
So the lesson for an academic community in thinking about that is how do we utilize research to reduce the confusion so that multiple actors can access information about how we can truly implement and where to point our efforts. The next tool or, or innovation that we think about is using industry collaboration. And it's really necessary to bring people together in order to drive change. So one example of this um, that we're working on is something called the Midwest Row Crop Collaborative. It's a group of suppliers, NGOs, local community leaders who've come together to work in Illinois, Nebraska, and Iowa. And what they collectively decided to do was look at nutrient runoff and water quality to see if we could bring more acres under management, um, optimize fertilizer, and think about water runoff. Now, if Walmart had simply gone to those same suppliers and said, you know what, we're really interested in sustainable practices, could you please figure out how to do that? That would have meant nothing to the farmer standing on her field and thinking about application of fertilizer and application of water. It, that market signal is not strong enough with one alone. It's the collaboration that makes the difference. Oh, sorry. See, I have to go back too. Go back, go back. OK, there we go. <laughs> the third tool is around transparency and data and why this matters so much. So what we measure matters, as you all know. And the greater our ability to see and have visibility into what's happening in supply chains, the greater our ability to be able to respond. So last year, for example, uh, we started piloting blockchain as a tool to look at how we could understand food systems faster. And so we started with a package of mangoes. And our staff internally in our home office went to the team and said, tell me where these mangoes came from. Any idea how long it took us to figure it out? Seven days. Seven days. Um, from a food safety point of view, if there is a recall, those seven days are significant. Um, and that is utilizing the best in class tools we have available today. And that's pretty darn good, actually. Um, so through this pilot, we started utilizing blockchain technology to see if we could repeat that same process again. So we went to a store. We picked out a package of mangoes, handed it to the team, and said, tell us where this came from. And it came from a farm in Mexico. Know how fast we knew that? 2.2 seconds. Significant. And the lesson there is not just that blockchain is the answer to everything, because it's not. <laughs> it is the answer to some things. Um, or it is at least promising to be an answer to some things. But it, it is a pilot. And there are still significant questions about scale and application and how we utilize it. And we're continuing to work with other suppliers to, to try other things. But the lesson there for how we think about this from an academic point of view is not just what do we need to collect, but how do we innovate around how. Because the faster and the more accurately we can do that, the faster and more accurately we can start to implement changes to some of these programs. The fourth tool, uh, again, seems very self-explanatory, but is actually one that I, I listened over the last couple of days. We really didn't talk a lot about. Um, and it is one that is on here not because we've done it particularly well, but we have noticed its lack. Um, when we haven't done it, it's made a difference. And that's engaging the people who are impacted by the issue in designing what the solutions need to look like. Now, a lesson from the deforestation world is that the major tools we've utilized in addressing and trying to combat deforestation have been around certifications, market signals, and government responses. But for that community who may not have an economically viable alternative and are trying to be able to survive and feed their families, that point of decision does not care about the market signal or the government regulation. They care about what is going to be best for their family. If we don't get to know what assets that community has as an alternative, we won't be successful. The fifth tool is around a very simple idea that economics actually drive change. Easier way to say this, if there's a strong enough business case, people will figure it out. And so the lesson here is that academics and this community can help actually define what that business case looks like. So for as an example, we set an aspiration to get zero waste to landfill when it came to food waste. We had no idea how to do it, none. None. But it turns out food waste is really expensive. And so that business case became an imperative to go figure it out. 
Over the last couple of years, just as one example, we've been testing strawberries. How do we reduce food waste in strawberries? And through a series of iterative sort of experiments, we've been able to take about a day and a half out of the supply chain, extended the freshness life by about two or three days, and 70% less strawberries are sitting in our warehouses and are actually out on the floor and out in stores. That's significant business value, and that drove a lot of innovation that wouldn't have otherwise existed. And where we can't do that necessarily, we also heavily invest in things like food recovery. Um, we donated about 750 million pounds of food last year to people in need. The six tools around consumer engagement and consumers helping to drive demand. Now, this one, I will say, is the hardest one to create. This is not something that we get to decide, but it's something that we can signal. So, for example, when we did our healthier food commitments in 2011, we not only reformulated product to be able to let's take out sugar and sodium and, and reduce both of those and take out trans fats completely, we also inter introduced an icon to help guide decision making. Um, we also, in this past year or so, with our suppliers, have introduced a best if used by date. So there's a lot of confusion. Is it sell by, use by? Has anyone had to like, is this milk still good? Right? So we put a date on it to help people understand and navigate that. It's now on about 92% of our private, land, private label brands in the United States. We estimate that that has actually resulted, that one change, in taking out about 660 million pounds of food waste from the system. That translates into about 900 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. One change. It's unbelievable the power of being able to do that kind of thing. That tool of consumer demand drives a lot of promise. It's really critical that we start thinking about how we shift some of the signaling. But it's not one that we're going to be able to just say, this is what we want, and consumers are going to automatically come there. Um, what they are saying is that they want sustainable food. But when they define that, they define it as diversely as we have over the last two days. And so technology, tools, information, those hold tremendous promise for us to be able to deliver more of the, that kind of information in a more tailored and systematic way. Um, so I'll leave you with one final thought which is, as we think about this intersection between research and application, research and implementation, it seems very simple, but there's really three lenses that I hope that you'll look through. One is, what really needs to happen? And I think that a lot of the research and work that we've heard over the last couple of days has been pointing us into, how should we think about the direction of what a sustainable food system looks like? The second is, why isn't it happening? And that's the engagement of the people who are actually making those choices every day. What are the frictions? What are the barriers? And how do we think about that? And then the final one was, what would have to be different tomorrow for us to get that system that we are looking for? So how do we move from those ideas into giving people the tools and the guidance to be able to shift into that behavior change? So I'll leave it there and answer questions. Thank you.